Um, my question is, what do you think about the current governance we have today in Ethereum, and specifically how we make major decisions? How, what are your thoughts on how we're doing that, and if it, like, it should be different? Um, so I've been involved in it really tangentially. I've attended a number of the developers meetups, which are public on Google Hangouts, and anyone can attend and watch. Um, I think a lot of the criticism of the governance model that's used in Ethereum is unfounded. Um, in that, if you actually watch the proceedings and you understand the dynamics between developers and the way these things have evolved over time, it's clear that there aren't really many dominant ideas or domineering positions. People can come up with positions that are out of the ordinary. They can present them as an EIP. They can bring them up to the core developer meetups and have a conversation very openly. Um, I haven't heard anyone being shouted down or turned away or chased out of that meeting for expressing a different opinion. In fact, if anything, the funny thing is if you if you watch it from the outside, you're like, okay, so the person who's in charge of Ethereum is X, or the three people who are in charge of Ethereum are X, Y, Z, and then you watch one of these developer meetups, and they're clearly not in charge. The beauty of actually knowing these people, like if you're one of the if you've just joined Ethereum and you look back and you're like, "Oh my God, this 19-year-old kid," and you're in awe, right? And but here's the thing: that is a result of distance. Once you get to know the kid, he's just a kid, very nice guy, and so is everybody else in Ethereum. So all of that awe gets washed away. And you suddenly start dealing with another person who has ideas that are sometimes right and sometimes not. And you have an argument and a debate and a reasoned discussion. I haven't seen anyone on the developer calls kind of um, defer to authority. And I think that's powerful. The one thing I would say is that in Ethereum the developers are more powerful than the miners. In Bitcoin, the miners tried to use their power, and we ended up with a bit of a constitutional crisis. You know, it's kind of like making a national emergency declaration when there is no emergency. <laughs> was that left wing, or was that just anti-fascist? Anti-fascist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the bottom line is that um, I think there are some differences in governance, but they are mostly that interplay between miners and developers. I think the, the Ethereum community, one of the reasons that it is not insular and it is not um, heavily controlled, is because you have a much bigger ecosystem of application developers, adaplication developers, library framework, Etc. developers who are trying to take what the core developers do and make it work in a, in a very broad range of use cases. And that keeps the protocol in check, meaning that if you start breaking things for thousands of application developers, you are not going to hear the end of it. Right? And so that is a balance that doesn't exist in Bitcoin. Right? In Bitcoin, it is a single application platform. And so there are a few voices that can really direct that. And many of those voices are large corporations. Um, so, you know, I have an ambivalent perspective on it. Uh, I hope that was a satisfactory answer. Great, great answer. Thank you. Thank you, Jameson. I absolutely believe in everything you've said about unstoppable code, and I believe that the reason why all of us are in this room is because of unstoppable code. But we saw a few years ago when the DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization, uh, had a problem. The Ethereum Foundation was able to exert enough influence on the community. They exerted a central influence on a distributed set of nodes to roll back certain transactions 
which in effect meant that that code was Stopped. stoppable. Yeah. What are your comments on this uh, on this fact? Thank you. That's a great question, Michael. And I, I did some talks about the DAO situation back then. Um, so a couple of disclosures. Um, one, yes, I invested in the DAO. Um, Sixteen dollars. Um, because I wanted to see the voting system, but I understood that this was alpha level code at best, so that's as much as I was confident putting in. Um, I think the DAO was a simple case of two terrible choices, and neither of which is any better than the other. Uh, on the one hand, you've got the possibility of one person having 14 percent of the ETH in circulation. Uh, just a year before you go to proof of stake, uh, two years, four years before you go to proof of stake. <laughs> but still, an unattainable situation because that could cause some wrinkles in the future. Um, and you know, I do believe in the idea of a mulligan, right? You know what a mulligan is? It's in golf, right? So when you you're doing your golfing and you break a window and you go, oh, can I do that one again? Mulligan. And you try again, right? My golf game consists of only mulligans, so there you go. Um, I think this was a case where it was early enough, the stakes weren't that high, and there were two bad choices. I think that it creates a bad precedent because every time that happens, it weakens the ability of all of the people involved in those decisions or promoting those decisions to say later, I can't. It makes the can't sound more like won't. And so I have a rule in life, which is when you make decisions, when you write emails, uh, when you communicate with people, always think, how would this sound if it was being read aloud to my mother? And how would this sound if it was being read aloud to a grand jury or a congressional hearing, and I'm the one sitting in the chair? Right? So when it comes to making these decisions, I transport my mind that I'm thinking, okay, you made the decision, now you're sitting in front of the congressional committee, and they're saying, Mr. Andreas, uh, there are now terrorists from ISIS trying to buy child pornography in order to trade it for drugs. Just combine all of them together. Uh, <laughs> and we need you to stop this dab. Your honor, sirs, congress people, distinguished ma'am, whatever the title is, I'm afraid I can't do it. Well, but in August of 2014, as the record shows, you in fact did do it. So why do you say you can't do it now? Oh, that was a mulligan. <laughs> so uh, allow me to explain, uh, members of Congress. So when you're playing golf <laughs> and you break a window, <laughs> so it goes downhill from there. This is a very dangerous precedent, and I think. We all got away with it. There's a lot of people in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency environments that are very, very smug about the DAO. Um, I think we should all be a lot more humble when we see a stumble. Yep, that rhymes accidentally. But the idea being that every cryptocurrency is going to have crises, is going to have bugs, is going to have problems. Bitcoin did. It, it had a, a moment where it issued a hundred billion Bitcoin in a single block. Oops. Yeah, that's a bad one. It's like ha hard, sound money with a fixed monetary policy. Oops. <laughs> it's okay. These things happen. The question is, can we mature past these and learn the lesson? And so for the DAO, there were two lessons. One is, don't put too much money in untested code. And the other lesson is. That was your last mulligan, friends. The next one is going to carry consequences, and maybe you got away with this one. So, um, I want to kind of start with Bitcoin as an example to it, where uh, since with Bitcoin you can introduce censorship due to the pseudo-anonymous 
nature of the addresses. And some other protocols make that infeasible at a protocol level due to uh, different encryption uh, and crypto uh, cryptographical approaches to things. Um, following into something like Ethereum with unstoppable code where um, I and I'm sure many others would worry if the oops clause has already been too late for Ethereum or anything like that. Uh, if uh, at a cryptographic level when you can't really know how, like, uh, he, do, do you see that sort of as, as the way to go with things where uh, at a protocol level I can't roll anything back because I don't know how to uh, uh, find the outputs that were responsible for the thing or what have you. So I was wondering on your thoughts on that. Well, I, 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 I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but I think one of the things we can do um, when we make decisions about how we develop code, and even when we make decisions about how we develop a platform, um, and you know, I don't, I don't really have a role in that. I'm mostly the explainer who comes in afterwards and goes, "Let me tell you what just happened." But I think one of the decisions we we can make is if we put unstoppable characteristics into the protocol, into the encryption, into the various layers of the protocol, what we're doing is we're strengthening the can't defense. Right? So, okay, you've built an unstoppable DAP. Well, if you build an unstoppable DAP and you don't put any governance in it, and there's no way for you to stop the DAP, that gets appealed to the Supreme Court of Ethereum. Right? So, you've got to realize that a lot of the people we're going to be dealing with come from an institutional mentality, whereby they go, um, okay, young man. Let me speak to your manager, please. And so you call the right, the person who wrote the DAP, and they say, "No, no, no, I can't." Oh, okay, young man. Let me speak to your manager, young lady. Let me speak to your manager. And eventually, they're going to bump it up all the way up to Vitalik, probably, or somebody like that. And they're going to go, "Are you the manager?" The problem is you're going to get this escalation, right? So. If you can't stop the DAP, you try to stop the platform. If you can't stop the platform, you try to stop the network. If you can't stop the network, you try to stop the currency. If you can't stop the currency, you try to stop the exchanges that are exchanging the currency, and then you all find out why Bitcoin is a really useful ally. <laughs> because it's built some unstoppable money for you. Um, but Yes, we need to put these unstoppable characteristics deeper into the code, right? And that goes for building better privacy and confidentiality in the base layer of Bitcoin, in building ZK snarks and other capabilities in the base layer of Ethereum, creating more protocols for privacy, for mixing, for anonymity and things like that. It's very important to develop these technologies now, right? You can't become anonymous once they start coming after you. You need to do that in advance. 